22, 12 through 15. I, I really do uh, appreciate Belita and presenting this and, and uh, giving us an opportunity to learn a little bit about what they did. And uh, I heard someone the other day that knew someone that went on this trip. And uh, they were talking about Belita and how the, the, the people on the trip thought that, boy, she's just going to be a burden. <laughs> and then and then before before it was over, they were all saying, she's outdoing all of us. <laughs> so uh, God gave her a lot of energy. Okay, Revelation 22, 12 through 15. We're going to go quickly through these few verses, keep us on track here, and then... Tuesday night, God willing, we should finish the Revelation. And as I said earlier, next Sunday start the new series that we're going to be doing. So let's begin with uh, verse 12. It says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. The promise of a quick return of Christ is uh, repeated here from verse 7. And uh, some people are a little bit confused about the fact that it would be saying that he was going to come quickly, and it had been 2,000 years since that promise had been made. And what we need to understand about this is the proper or more proper um, translation would be, Behold, I am coming suddenly. Uh, and you can see the difference in that. The word quickly does not refer to an appointed time soon to come but it means that he's coming suddenly without warning and this would of course be referring to the first phase of the second coming which is uh, the rapture of the church then uh, Jesus says here my reward is with me to render to everyone according to what he has done now some people would take that and they would say aha works for salvation you can see it right here in scripture well that's not what is being taught here uh, the Greek word translated reward means what is due. Thus, the returning Christ will bring what is due. He will bring wages. Now, this sudden return refers only to the rapture of the church. So, the rapture deals in, as we know, only with born-again Christians. And therefore, those who have repented and have faith in Christ will be the ones that will be raptured when, uh, when Jesus comes. So it is talking here then about believers who have already been saved by grace through faith. A believer's salvation has nothing to do with wages earned to result in salvation. Therefore, the reward that is being referred to here is the reward that will be given to Christians when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ which will take place in heaven uh, sometime after the rapture of the church and the return of Christ uh, with the church at the end of the seven years. So the basis then of this reward is like we've talked about before. It is to have either lack of reward or reward which will be determined by the degree in which a person has served God faithfully as a Christian who has been saved by grace. And then that will enable that person to rule in a certain amount of authority depending on the reward that has been given to them in the thousand year reign uh, under Christ. Therefore, this verse does not teach salvation by works in any fashion. It's talking about people who are already saved. So uh, don't... Don't, and then there's, there's several verses of Scripture like this that a person can take out of context. They can, they can make it sound like that we're saying that to be saved, you've got to do certain works. But we know that that's not what the New Testament teaches. And so I hope you understand here then that this is talking about Christians. So instead, this refers then to rewards earned by a believer in accordance with their faithfulness or lack of faithfulness after they have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. Now verse 13. He's, <clears throat> he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now in Revelation 1.8 and in Revelation 21.6, the Lord God said, now keep the distinction here, 
in those two verses, God said that He was the Alpha and the Omega, which uh, simply means the beginning and the end in English. Here in Revelation 22, 13, it is Jesus who is saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Now we know it is Jesus because the context of these verses here is referring to the one who's coming quickly or the one who's coming suddenly. So we know that's Jesus that is being spoken about and not God. So what's the point? The point is simply this. This is another one of those places that is subtle but yet so uh, revealing the truth that Jesus is God. And, and there are places in Scripture that in the New Testament that come out and proclaim that Jesus is God. But there are, there are tons of places like this in the New Testament that as you read it, it doesn't make a statement, Jesus is God. But everything it's saying is proving that Jesus is God. Because here we see God saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saying it twice in other verses, and then this verse is about Jesus, and Jesus is saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So the same name then is being referred to God the Father and Jesus. And we know that the Scripture teaches the Trinity, which is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Only one God, but He has presented Himself to us in these three different ways. And one of the things I like to use in this that uh, it's sometimes helpful for people to understand this is, is simply this. God created us in His image. And in so doing, He made us body, soul, and spirit. So we are body, soul, and spirit. We are a triune in creation like God. But how many people are you? You're one, even though you're body, soul, and spirit. And uh, some people use the, the illustration of, of water uh, to help understand this. Uh, you have water in liquid form. You have water that is ice. Still water though, isn't it? And then you have water that is steam. All of those are just water. But they come in these three different uh, ways to us. So hopefully this is something that will help you a little bit understand uh, the teaching of the Trinity in Scripture. But mainly, I, I just want you to realize that in this verse, you see God calling Himself the same and Jesus calling Himself the same. Same, uh, creating uh, the teaching then that they are one and the same as other verses of Scripture teaches. <clears throat> now, verse 14. He says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and enter by the gates into the city. Again, we see John speaking to believers here in verse 12, uh, as uh, here in verse 14 also. So both of them is talking to believers. Those who wash their robes are blessed, he says. The washing of the robes here refers to the believer who is cleansed through repentance and faith in Christ. Again, it is not a reference to doing something for works in order to be saved. Uh, it is it's not that way any more than verse 12 was. Both of them are referring to people who have been saved by grace through faith. So again, do not uh, read this with the slant that some people would put on it, which would try to say that uh, that there are works that we have to do in order to be made right with God. Because anytime you come with works to go toward making someone a born-again Christian, you have left the New Testament truth and teaching. Okay? Are we, was I too loud? Not loud enough? Oh, okay. Thank you. But, but you see here, it, it's, it's really important to distinguish in, in between these. Now, those who have their robes washed through repentance and faith in Christ are going to receive two benefits. So this is talking then about Christians who are saved through repentance and faith in Christ in that they're spoken of then as their robes washed. 
and they have two benefits the, the right to the tree of life now what this simply in the in the most basic form in term is simply saying is that they have eternal life in the garden originally there were two trees the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and Adam and Eve were placed there and they were told to not eat of the tree of the life of good and evil once they ate of it Jesus uh, God said that they would they would die and what he meant was death would come in but he first meant that they would die spiritually because they lived almost 900 years after that so death is a part of sin physical death is a part of the penalty of sin but the main thing that happened to them when they ate the tree first of all was they died spiritually and their relationship with God was broken so then we realized that God uh, put angels to guard the tree of life. And the reason He did that was so that they would not in their sin then partake of the tree of life and then live eternally in their sin. And so the tree of life now is, is, is referring to eternal life that is offered to all of those who have uh, faith in Christ and, and are born again. And we're going to see that one of the things of heaven is going to be the tree of life uh, that that uh, it will be producing or the trees as it seems to be described there will be producing uh, fruit each month and there will be access to this fruit all during eternity from the tree of life now the second thing that they're going to benefit from is they will enter the gates of the holy city now, during the, the thousand year reign, there will be the rebuilt temple that will be in Jerusalem. And Jesus will rule and reign from there during the thousand years. That temple will be rebuilt sometime at the early part of the tribulation period. Um, the, the treaty that the Antichrist will make between Israel and the Arab nations for peace will enable the Jews to rebuild the temple okay so that's the earthly temple but the temple that is spoken of here we've already seen that there is no temple as it as itself uh, in the new heaven and the new earth because God is okay but what we will have is the holy city the new Jerusalem and so we will have this new holy city Jerusalem that will be where all the born-again Christians that make up the church will live throughout all eternity. We've already seen in our study that it's 1,500 miles in this direction, 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 and 1,500 miles up. So, what was it, Jeff, that we finally determined if there are 20 billion people in heaven? then each one of them would have a, a sixth of an acre. About a third. Five thirds of an acre in which the house that God, that Jesus promised to go prepare for them would be setting on a space five thirds of an acre. One third. Well, excuse me, one third of an acre. I'm just taking your words here. One third of an acre, excuse me. Uh, one third of an acre. So, I don't know that there are going to be 20 billion people in heaven. There may be more, there may be less. But this gives us a little bit of an idea in a, in a place of the size that the Scripture says. You're not going to be jammed in there, okay? And you're going to have this fabulous place that God has built for you. And you're going to have it on a third of an acre of what we would count. Now, I don't know how that will work, whether it will be a pyramid going up and when it reaches the top, it will be a, a pyramid at 1,500 miles up or whether it will be a cube in which it just goes up like a straight building and each one of us has a certain amount of uh, place to live and uh, space uh, in that new heaven and new Jerusalem. But that's what is being spoken of here. It is so much the place where the bride of Christ, the church, will spend eternity uh, with God that we've seen in, in past studies in the, the Revelation, it is actually referred to when it's seen coming down from heaven as the bride of Christ. 
So uh, this is this is a very special place. You say, well, where's everybody else going to live? Well, the the people that were uh, made right with God through different dispensations, or were not were made right with God but not part of the church age, they're going to live in the new earth in which the new heavenly Jerusalem will be placed upon. And of course, the Jews that get saved during the tribulation, uh, they're going to have then uh, all the land that God promised Abraham uh, that, that God was going to give them. In no time so far have the Jews ever possessed all the land that God promised to give them. But I believe that during the thousand year reign, they will possess all of it and live on it. And I personally believe that they will live in that same area in the new heaven and the new earth that's going to be presented uh, that will be eternal. So, these are two benefits that those people uh, will receive. Now, verse 15. It says, Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. So, this verse causes some difficulty for some people. And it's simply this. It, it could give you the impression that here's the holy city that is just being spoken of. And then it could give you the impression that there are these evil, sinful people people described in these different uh, characteristics that we saw in this verse that are lurking around outside the city just waiting for an opportunity to try to get in or something. Now, I don't know if any of you have that picture in your mind when you read this or not, but but that's sort of what comes to me. And uh, Phyllis, uh, she's not here today. She's visiting her son, but uh, Phyllis had the same thought and she had asked me about this. But what I want you to realize when we look at this verse, we're not talking about outside being just outside the, the, the temple or the city wall. We're talking about that these will be people who are not right with God that will never have an opportunity not only to enter the holy city, but they will not have an opportunity to be uh, even live in the new earth that's going to be built. We're going to see where they are outside of the city, okay? So just keep that in mind. I think it will be a little easier for you to understand. So, so far the verses that we've dealt with this morning have dealt with those who, uh, verses that pertain to all believers. This is those who have accepted Christ. Now John turns his attention to the lost or to those who have not accepted Christ and where they're going to be. Now, John doesn't specify in this verse exactly where they're going to be. He's just saying outside the city. Okay? Because nothing unholy can come into the city. But if you will recall, when we looked at Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, which precedes where we are in the Revelation now, we saw that all of those who have not been made right with God through repentance and faith, whether it be in the Old Testament dispensation, the New Testament dispensation, or the uh, tribulation time, or those that were, will be born during the thousand year reign. That uh, any and all of those that did not come to faith in God through repentance and faith, uh, turning from sin and faith, then they were, they were brought to, they were brought out of Hades, a place of literal fire and torment where they had been since they died, and they were brought to the great white throne judgment. And in that judgment, remember, talked about the books being opened, all of their deeds were presented. But then another book was opened, and that was the book of life. And so they were brought to this judgment. They stood before the judgment seat. There was a, a, a rendering of all the deeds that they had done in their whole life. And then there was a check to see if their name was in the book of life. Their deeds proved that they were a sinner, which all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But their name not being in the book of life proved that they had not 
accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. And all of those, no matter what distance, they were not made right with God in the plan of salvation that He had in that dispensation. All of those people then at that judgment were ultimately thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death, which is what we think about as the eternal hell. So, when we read this verse and we see that it says the statement here about uh, outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the immoral persons, and, and on and on. It is talking about outside where they are. They're outside of the new earth. They're outside of the new city. They're already in the place, the lake of fire, that they will remain uh, with the devil and his angels throughout all eternity and be tormented for the sins that Jesus paid the price for. So, if that sort of makes you think that they are somehow in the new earth lurking around the gates of the new city, they're not. They are already outside of that blessed place in the place of, uh, of torment throughout all eternity. And the sad thing is, in God's eyes, they're going to be no more sinners than you and I are going to be who are going to be in the city enjoying all the blessings of Christ throughout all eternity. The only difference is going to be they didn't accept Christ and the Christian did. So, you know, nobody is this huge, horrible, bad sinner that God doesn't want to save. If they don't get saved, it's not because God didn't want to save them. It's because they didn't follow in obedience the plan that God had for their salvation. And everyone that follows that gets saved and then they will spend eternity uh, with God in this holy city, the New Jerusalem. Or if they're brought to God in another uh, dispensation during the history of man on earth, then they will have the access <clears throat> to live in the new earth that will be created. And again, if it's the Jews, I believe they're going to live on the full area uh, on, on the globe that God promised Abraham in the beginning that would be the place uh, for his people. So I hope that uh, dispels any misunderstanding there that that, that word outside uh, might bring to mind. Now I have just a couple of minutes and we're going to finish pretty much on time. Let me just talk for briefly about the different categories here of people. There's six different categories he uses here. Now, some of these have already been mentioned, uh, and we talked about them a few weeks ago. But let me mention the ones he, he lists here. But let me encourage you to realize that this is not by any means even close to all the sins that a person could be capable of committing. For some reason, he just uses uh, this list at this point in time to speak of the sins that would make people not be able to come into the new uh, city or the new uh, uh, heaven and earth. So, why, as I said, he mentions these particular ones, I don't know. But let's look at these briefly. He says, the first here are dogs. <clears throat> now, the term dog in the New Testament is connected with evil men, 